topic for today is uh, food resources. Uh, food is uh, extremely essential. We, we saw water and energy which are also essential. Food is also and it is food is interesting because it is again very closely related to the some of the other problems like the, the water problem, then uh, biodiversity and uh, the um, overall biosphere. So, um, unfortunately there are many, many problems rela related to food and in many parts of the world including uh, many parts in India there are the hunger statistics are really very disturbing. So, this picture shows the plight of a woman who is unable to feed her family because the food prices uh, went up by as high as 600 percent. So, she is forced to feed her children with some wild cabbage. So, okay, this is the outline of, uh, of the talk. We will we'll discuss uh, the various dimensions, the various problems uh, in this um, area of uh, food, the related hunger, poverty and things like that. And then in the uh, other part, we will we'll try to uh, look at the various solutions uh, that, that can come out. And again, there are a number of good ideas. We do not know which idea is the, is the best. I do not think there is a, a single best idea. There are many good ideas and there are uh, some ideas that are, that are probably not very good. So, uh, we will discuss that when we get over there. Okay. This was a, a newspaper article uh, several years ago showing how uh, driven to starvation even children have to feed on uh, mud cakes. Uh, that, that is the level of starvation that exists in the world. India is ranked 15th in the global hunger index uh, and uh, we have something like uh, 23 percent of people who go hungry. The malnourishment statistics in India are also very, very disturbing 60 percent of India's children below the age of 3 are malnourished according to a 2005 report. Now, related to the hunger, poverty, lack of sanitation or poor sanitation, very closely related to that is the uh, health issues, infectious diseases and things like that which again are a, a major concern. So, when you are basically if you are not healthy and if the surroundings are, are not clean and uh, if the water and food that you consume is not hygienic. Uh, then you get so many diseases. Now, if you actually look at the world food production, there is probably uh, as of now there is enough to feed everybody uh, as in nobody should starve uh, and this is because uh, due to uh, the, the green revolution and uh, so many advances in uh, irrigation and uh, agricultural technologies, uh, the uh, food availability has risen since the 1960s to 2008 is, is what this number is about. So, uh, we, we have uh, roughly 2790 calories, it should be calories uh, per person per day. Uh, so, uh, in that sense uh, at present we, we have uh, sufficient, but um, the population uh, presently is at uh, just above 7 billion. Uh, in the next couple of decades it is likely to rise up to uh, 9 billion and if that happens then uh, the situation is going to be very different. Uh, we will not have enough food to feed everybody. Uh, the, the starvation that we observe uh, in different parts of the world is in spite of the world producing enough food in the first place. So, the, the, the problem really is that although food is being produced, maybe adequate food is not being produced where there is poverty and starvation. So, the, the distribution uh, is, is uh, actually the issue. So, this graph kind of shows you how uh, we presently make enough food and how in 2050, so this is the, this is the line, okay. we, we have to make at least this much, this is the rec recommended uh, consumption of food and um, by 2050 we are, uh, the world as a whole is likely to fall below that line. So, uh, a major problem is coming and in spite of producing adequate food for everybody, we have so many people starving. So, you can imagine that if you are not producing on an average, if you are not producing adequate food, uh, then uh, how many people will uh, have to starve. 
So, uh, these are again again more numbers you know this, this slide basically shows you about uh, how much inequality there is in society whereas, uh, so many people are starving I mean there is so and there is a large number of people below the poverty line. Um, for instance, 80 percent of the world population lives on less than 10 dollars a day. At the same time, you have the world's 358 billionaires who have assets that exceed the combined annual incomes of countries which hold 45 percent of the world's population. So, that is the level of these 358 really, really rich guys. Uh, they have so much of assets uh, that uh, it is, it is uh, those assets are larger than the entire annual incomes of countries which hold more than uh, just under half of the world population. So, um, in this scenario do you think that solving the hunger problem is impossible? Actually, it is uh, it, although the numbers uh, of people starving and the numbers below poverty line seem to be large, uh, but uh, if, if it is if it is only about feeding everybody uh, that that may not be that difficult, um, the, the some nice uh, a, a examples kind of uh, show you how it could actually be possible. So, uh, I mean these are kind of uh, funny examples. Uh, so, for the price of uh, one missile, uh, a school full of children, a school full of hungry children could eat lunch every day for 5 years. Um, or, or the, the second uh, statistic which says that uh, in the decade between 1990 to 2000 roughly 100 million children died due to starvation. So, that number could actually be saved if uh, the world military expenditure world over of all countries put together. Uh, if, if that military expenditure stopped just for 2 days and all that money was diverted to feeding people uh, just within 2 days of the world military expenditure you could you could have fed uh, all, all the 100 million children that died or it, it, that amounts to just the price of uh, 10 stealth bombers. But what is actually happening is quite the reverse, uh, there are uh, the rich are busy uh, satisfying their luxuries and uh, the poor are not getting enough. So, this cartoon shows how, uh, so there is a global north and a global south, basically it is the rich versus the poor may be the rich countries versus poor countries or it could also mean rich people within a country uh, versus uh, poor people within that country. So, uh, you see how uh, the, the rich people are uh, so worried about feeding their SUV uh, with biofuel. So, uh, these are the world's food resources. Uh, so, the plentiful food resources of the world are being converted to uh, the agricultural land and you know things like sugar cane and uh, stuff to make bioethanol uh, or corn. Uh, so, all that uh, the, the biofuels are going to feed uh, the rich people um, whereas, the uh, people who are starving uh, they do not have enough food to feed their children. So, this is uh, I said that, uh, that it is a distribution problem and um, a very important factor in that is the fluctuating prices. So, when prices fluctuate very drastically as indicated in this figure, uh, the uh, poor people uh, are greatly affected. People like you and me are hardly affected because uh, the, the fraction of our salary or our income uh, that goes towards food is relatively smaller whereas, the uh, for poor people uh, it, it makes all the difference if there is a 50 percent or 100 percent rise in the prices of rice or wheat or maize or whatever it is. Um, so, the reasons uh, these uh, prices fluctuate are many, uh, sometimes it is caused by some losses in yields due to adverse weather conditions, sometimes um, the, the energy costs uh, I mean these, these prices kind of follow the uh, costs of uh, energy um, the, on the world market. Uh, there is an always uh, the, the general increasing trend in many cases is due to uh, pressure uh, of rising population. Uh, there is also an increased preference for meat and dairy products among uh, consumers. So, that uh, that leads to um, 
scarcity because actually uh, and we are going to see that towards the end uh, we are going to see how uh, uh, meat consumption makes uh, re requires more land to support an individual uh, think of it in terms of the uh, ecological footprint uh, if your if your food choices are um, towards meat and dairy uh, consumption then um, your the land required to support you is much higher than uh, if you were a vegetarian. So, uh, but, but there is an increased preference world over for these products and that again is worsening the problem. Uh, again, part of the food crops or part of the land required for food crops is being diverted towards biofuel production. Uh, there are also uh, issues of financial speculation and price fixing that goes on, so uh, which, which worsen this problem. And then there are policy factors also. So, uh, due to a combination of all these factors, you know, you have these prices that fluctuate and it is, it is simply not helping uh, the poor. Now, uh, we, we've spoken about the, the rise in population expected uh, in the next couple of years. So, uh, that is going to put tremendous pressure on the available arable land. So, if you look at the world arable land over the past uh, half a century, you will see how it has been steadily decreasing and if the population goes on increasing that trend is going to continue. So, if you, uh, if you see and uh, the, since the population density is in various continents and various places is different, uh, on the left you see uh, that um, Asia for instance has got very little arable land per capita as opposed to uh, some other parts of the world. Now, in India, you see that uh, roughly 60 percent of uh, India's land is under agriculture and um, uh, in spite of having so much land under agriculture, India uh, can uh, on an average does not boast of very high productivities in the world. In fact, um, our uh, productivities uh, are often um, maybe several times less than the world's highest productivities. And the reasons again are many, but uh, primary among them are probably soil and land degradation, the low uh, fraction of land, arable land that is irrigated is also one of the important things. And then in many places, um, agricultural technology and know-how is again limited. So, uh, that again, the, the yields could be boosted by, by that. So, what I have been showing so far may appear a little disconnected because I'm, I'm, I'm touching upon many different topics, but I'm just uh, maybe uh, sharing with you the various issues uh, that, that exist, the various dimensions of this problem that exist and uh, maybe drawing a few connections between all of them. There are many more connections that you could make, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm maybe pointing out at some, some only few of them. When there is adequate food available, uh, but still people are, are, are starving, one important reason uh, why that is happening is food wastage and spoilage. So, uh, food gets produced, but perishable commodities uh, before they even reach the market, uh, fruits and vegetables, um, uh, you know, they require, uh, they, they, they do not have a very long shelf life and uh, transportation infrastructure is limited. Uh, cold storage facilities in many places are, are totally absent. In some places, there are they are again very limited and then they are tightly controlled. So, the chances that a small farmer or poor farmer uh, can avail of these fac uh, facilities is again very slim. There are uh, warehouses or go-downs where uh, grain is uh, stored, but it is rotting, uh, rat infested go-downs. Um, so, there are a number of problems. Moreover, when the food is actually purchased by us, even cooked food, uh, be it fruits, vegetables or even cooked food, uh, that has gone through so many operations and so many processes and activities to reach our home or to reach our plate, uh, that again is being wasted uh, by, uh, by I, I think in most families, uh, a sizable uh, proportion of food uh, get, ends up getting wasted. Some things just, just rot uh, out there, some things get spoilt in the refrigerator, you just forget about it. And uh, some people, uh, you know, have a habit of um, serving food for themselves and then uh, not consuming that. 
all, all these things put together um, you know maybe add up to this number which says that one third of the world's food is being wasted uh, while 0.8 billion people go hungry. So, I think this is this is something where directly uh, our our habits our consumption habits can definitely make uh, uh, at least a small impact. So, the, the spoilage that happens during transportation and lack of uh, cold storage facilities that is not for us consumers to uh, to do much about, but um, at least after purchasing of the food uh, to ensure that we purchase only what is required and then uh, what is what, what is purchased is properly consumed. If it is before it, is, it gets spoiled, if it is possible to give it to somebody who is in need then that is um, definitely useful. So, now um, there are uh, various uh, threats uh, to our food security in the present and in the future. I have listed them uh, all on one page. Some of those things I have, I have explained in the previous slides. Some will be explained in, in the uh, subsequent slides, but this slide is kind of a summary of, of the various threats. And uh, each, of, each of these points uh, has uh, a, a lot many dimensions. So, you can uh, maybe use your imagination and when you, when you discuss with your students, you can take one or more of, of these, uh, these issues in, in more detail. Uh, you could even have discussions with students. Uh, so, so, the examples are rising population. So, uh, yesterday evening we had a session on the, uh, the on society and environment and population is uh, definitely one of the important issues over there. So, when you discuss population you can you can connect it to uh, to this topic or when you when you discuss this topic you could connect it uh, to that topic. Th these connections are, are what uh, you know what are very important and a lot of times are missing and that is why students end up uh, leaving the class confused and they do not get a coherent picture and when they do not get that then it, it kind of uh, worsens that lack of interest and lack of motivation that they already have for this course. Okay, so uh, you have unequal distribution, diversion of food grains as livestock feed or uh, biofuels. So when I when I said that meat consumption uh, requires more land to support you, it is because the the uh, livestock feeds on the land and you feed on the livestock. So uh, so you become so instead of becoming a primary consumer, you become a secondary consumer. And people who uh, remember a little bit about the uh, the trophic pyramid, uh, you will realize that the, it is pyramidal in shape, which means that uh, some of the biomass as well as some of the energy gets wasted as you go from uh, one trophic level to the other. So, um, this, these are all these uh, connections that we need to make you back to ecology and things like that. Global climate change uh, is, is one major issue uh, because uh, with uh, global climate change more droughts, famines, floods, severe weather episodes and things are uh, possible are, are more likely and if that happens if uh, the ra rainfall patterns and things change uh, then um, the uh, food shortage is going to be very serious. There is uh, another important issue of GMOs and uh, although I will not cover too much in this uh, uh, in these two sessions. Uh, but uh, there is there is adequate material available and I will point you to some, some sources, so you can uh, do that on your own. So, uh, very related to the GMOs uh, is loss of crop and wild biodiversity. Our crops uh, maybe a uh, hundred years ago had a tremendous uh, diversity within the crops. So, if you, if you talk of rice, um, most people commonly uh, know only a few varieties of rice, at least most, most people living in urban places know only a few varieties of rice, but India is the cradle of the rice plant and uh, it has thousands of varieties of, uh, of rice of different colors, of uh, different sizes, of different shapes, of different tastes and flavors and which can grow in different places. So, uh, there, there, are, uh, there is rice which will grow which does not require flooded fields. Uh, there, there are uh, there are highly fragrant uh, varieties of rice. All these uh, th this variety existed in various crops, including vegetables, uh, not only food grains, in fruits and vegetables and things like that. We still have uh, adequate uh, variety, but it is shrinking. 
and it is shrinking because uh, of uh, preference towards only select varieties uh, and, and that preference is again engineered, it is, uh, it, it is due to advertising and lots of um, uh, even, even some very shady tactics uh, by uh, major corporations uh, where uh, we are losing our, our choice to, uh, to purchase uh, various varieties and farmers are losing their choice on what to plant. Even, even though uh, some of the local varieties are better adapted to their soil and uh, local conditions. Okay, so we, we looked at these various dimensions of that, uh, of the food crisis and um, we know that in future uh, food availability is going to be low. So um, now we need to find solutions and uh, talking of solutions, what comes to our mind is we must grow more food and improve our productivity and our only uh, friend uh, to enable us to do, do that is technology. And um, technology has helped us overcome so many problems in the past and this problem is no different. We can um, count on technology to uh, help us tide over this problem. So in that direction, maybe we need to move towards industrial agriculture it is already uh, agriculture is already uh, like an industry uh, in the in the west so we need to adopt those things like mechanization you have these large uh, tractor combines and you have chemical fertilizers herbicides and whatnot biotechnology even genetic engineering um, a lot of people think this way but is this the only uh, only way or is this the best way? So there is, there is doubt because there is a debate whether, whether this is the best way. And that's why I've put a, a huge question mark. Uh, for engineers, it is almost natural to think in this direction that uh, if there is a problem, that technology will solve it. Uh, but um, these are biological systems. Uh, we, we need to think a little different. But anyway, if we are in doubt, uh, we can always look up to our leaders, our world leaders, um, they are surely aware of these problems and they must be busy solving the problem or let us see. There was a G8 summit several years ago on uh, the alleviation of the food crisis and uh, uh, poverty in uh, Japan and uh, all these leaders, the world leaders, they met over there to find a solution for these people, for the poor people. And guess what? This was a newspaper article. I, I liked it very much, so I picked it up. Uh, it's a, they were enjoying an 18-course banquet as they discussed how to solve the global food crisis. And in case uh, you are wondering uh, what was on the menu, it's an 18-course it's an banquet after all. So we have this too, interesting stuff. This is exactly what the starving millions need. If you are convinced that our leaders are, are really busy solving this problem, I am not convinced. So I think, I think we need to think a little different. Let us look at some of the solutions. Um, I, I give you some examples of um, how much uh, it would take or what it would take to feed all the all the poor people in the world and it turns out that it, it might not be that difficult if these world leaders actually intended to do uh, do good they would have done it long ago but uh, not much progress has happened in that direction so uh, the problem persists and um, solutions will have to uh, evolve let's uh, let's look at uh, the, the first, maybe only a theoretical solution because uh, the theoretical solution is that through proper food distribution, we can uh, solve the uh, world hunger problem for now. And that is easier said than done, but uh, let us just look at that. Since the world already produces enough food, it can be theoretically solved, but the problem is that the excess food production is in countries where it is not required. So it is fed to cows and pigs and in the countries where uh, there is starvation, there they are not able to make food. And in order to uh, distribute the food from 
uh, where there is excess um, to uh, where there is a, a insufficient food is uh, is not happening because of the global um, market and the prices it is unaffordable to the poor people within a country and it is unaffordable to poor countries uh, now these many of these poor countries are in debt and if they are in debt they uh, they f have to essentially encourage or even force their farmers to grow ca cash crops so that they can export the the produce and get some money for the country so uh, that that is not helping uh, this problem because when they grow more of cash crops uh, there is less attention to the um, the food scarcity of in that country and the malnutrition problem um, again wars in some places uh, are a, 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 a very important reason why so many people die of starvation if roads are damaged rail railroads are damaged if um, food resources cannot reach the starving let's say there is a drought in a in a certain place um, food and other supplies have to reach that place but if the roads and things are damaged uh, as commonly happens in case of a war uh, then uh, the uh, the aid will not reach those people and then the starvation deaths uh, increase very drastically so uh, a country which has which has to fund uh, an ongoing war naturally cannot pay attention to uh, modernization of their uh, agriculture or improving their agriculture even even standing fields can be burnt down so uh, no wonder it it causes so much of uh, starvation okay there are uh, now these things the international um, uh, issues like wars and uh, the economic um arrangements maybe uh, they they are not easy to solve uh, but at least within within countries if the uh, markets and the transportation infrastructure and all that can be improved uh, that can definitely uh, go a long way so i have i have listed several uh, things that uh, can be done in order to improve distribution within a, a country and uh, you, you can again go through it later i i'm not going to uh, go much into it now there's um, in in the context of food distribution uh, there is a uh, uh, there there is a concept called as food mile so i'd just like you to uh, to note this uh, point the total miles covered by the food item uh, the total distance in in miles or kilometers covered by the food item from the farm to your plate is is what is food miles so uh, if you are consuming food items uh, for example we are here in mumbai and um, if i if i go out in the market and i buy some apples so obviously no apples grow in mumbai so where do they grow they they, they grow in kashmir so from kashmir to mumbai uh, the the apple has traveled all the way to reach my plate so the the food miles uh, associated with that are very high now the the higher the food miles the greater the environmental impact and how does that environmental impact come about uh, the the transportation uh, is probably by road or rail and both these means of transportation uh, use fossil fuels so there are greenhouse gas emissions so for every apple that reaches over here some amount of carbon dioxide has been emitted so it is important from a sustainability point of view to reduce the average food miles when we make choices of purchasing food items uh, we we can make intelligent choices so that we reduce the the food miles moreover the longer the distance the food has to travel from the field to your plate uh, the greater the chance of spoilage so uh, from from kashmir all the way to mumbai uh, the the train or the or the truck uh, does not reach in one day so if it, if it has to uh, if it has to spend several days and sometimes stranded at uh, at various check posts and things like that things rot uh, they get spoiled F fungal diseases will attack it so uh, this leads to more and more spoilage from a sustainability point of view it is uh, most preferable to source your food locally 
So try to try to get things that grow locally and try to get things that grow in that season. So uh, placing a demand for apples in uh, summer uh, is encourages large quantities of storage of apples in the cold storage. But in, in, in the summer in, in Mumbai, for instance, there are mangoes are plentiful. So uh, why not have mangoes? Why do we need apples in, in the uh, summer months? So there are different uh, varieties of fruits. There are some local varieties of fruits which are very tasty, very healthy, uh, which, uh, which we can. And the same applies to, to vegetables also. So consuming uh, out of season uh, produce um, leads to uh, more spoilage. So more food has to be stored in cold storage and some, some spoilage is inevitable over there. Okay, so there are there are more points, and you can uh, you can go through them. Now this is um, what what we saw is that that distribution can uh, can see us through for now, but uh, that's not a, a complete solution because the population is rising and the demand for food is going to increase. So we need some solution, and can industrial agriculture be that solution? Is the question. So. Before we even attempt uh, to uh, to uh, look at solutions, uh, I think uh, it's um, obvious that uh, there is no easy or simple solution. As um, Professor Parthasarthi also mentioned, the so-called simple or simplistic solutions are probably not solutions at all. The the uh, the food problem is very complex, and we need to uh, go deep and understand various things. Uh, there are there are various aspects to it. There is an economic aspect. There are social aspects. There are ecological aspects, biodiversity uh, re related issues. So the, we have to analyze the situation from uh, various angles, and uh, only then can we uh, come up with solutions. But anyway, since the uh, uh, many people think that industrial agriculture can uh, can solve the food crisis, let us try to uh, to understand that problem. Now it turns out that around the, this uh, this data is from around 2010. Uh, it turns out that agriculture has a, a very important um, contribution in uh, the uh, adverse global impacts, global environmental impacts. So if you look at greenhouse uh, gas emissions, 24 percent of greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from agriculture, and uh, 37 percent of land mass is used for agriculture. This is excluding Antarctica because there is no agriculture over there. Uh, if you look at water withdrawal uh, through surface as well as groundwater sources, 70 percent of water withdrawals all over the world are for agriculture. So the, uh, the, the impacts of um, present agriculture, now present agriculture is, is a mix between um, traditional agriculture and industrial agriculture. In, in the west you have more of uh, industrial agriculture, in, in some of the developing countries you have some traditional uh, methods that are still used, but with the traditional methods they, they have uh, started adopting uh, chemical fertilizers and uh, other agrochemicals. So if you, uh, what, what we saw in, uh, in general over here and in a quantitative manner, if we if we look at it in greater detail, you will see that uh, the conventional form of agriculture uh, has, has various activities that are done and almost each activity has got very uh, major environmental impacts. For instance, uh, when the land is cleared for agriculture, as is happening on a large scale in, in the Amazon, uh, but it is happening in many parts of the world also, uh, there is a loss of biodiversity and habitats. There is topsoil loss. Uh, topsoil is uh, one of the greatest uh, resources that we have. That is how we get our food, uh, but we are not paying adequate attention to it. And uh, due to erosion and um, many other degradation processes, uh, the topsoil is being lost. Now, uh, I, I also explained to you in the topic on water how uh, when uh, land is uh, it does not uh, have vegetation, and it is exposed to uh, sunlight and uh, drying out, uh, then the, the uh, recharge of uh, groundwater uh, is reduced because the, uh, the water tends to run off more rather than uh, percolating underground. Uh, also uh, the land clearing is associated with carbon emissions. Uh, 
if you when when biomass uh, on the land is is cut uh, and parts of it is burnt uh, the carbon is returned to the atmosphere and not only is the biomass above the soil but there is a lot of biomass under the soil also so when there is deforestation the biomass that uh, that is under the soil also dies and like the root mass basically uh, it uh, and there are microorganisms and soil humus and things like that that gradually that, that starts emitting either carbon dioxide or methane depending on the conditions uh, and uh, contributes to global warming so land clearing the first step in in any agriculture uh, causes so many environmental impacts then when you run heavy machinery like tractors and all that that again damage the soil there is compaction of the soil soil must be porous uh, it should be uh, porous crumbly and uh, light in nature if it, if you run heavy machinery over that it gets compacted if it gets compacted then uh, water cannot water and roots water roots and air cannot penetrate uh, into the soil and uh, it may lead to even water logging if there is, if there are rains uh, heavy rains or uh, um, heavy irrigation and the equipment also obviously consumes oil so there is an oil dependence and carbon emissions associated with that now plowing is uh, thought to be very fundamental for uh, agriculture uh, but plowing leads to soil damage it leads to loss of soil structure porosity moisture and when uh, organic carbon from the soil is lost the ability of the soil to hold moisture uh, also reduces the 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 biological community that exists in the soil soil is a living entity there is uh, there is not a uh, soil is not only mineral it is uh, there, there is inorganic matter and there is a lot of organic matter there are uh, um, microscopic uh, creatures there are larger creatures like earthworms uh, that all live together and um, make the soil uh, fertile so uh, they uh, when when you plow it it reduces their populations and leads to uh, carbon emissions now fertilizers um, encourage fast plant growth the npk fertilizers but it can also lead to micronutrient deficiencies so that is another problem uh, associated with modern agriculture and when when there are some deficiencies then the plants become more susceptible to uh, to certain uh, diseases so likewise you can go through uh, each of these uh, environmental impacts and uh, i would like to emphasize over here that you can you can note down uh, the, this uh, the name of the title of this slide in your notebook uh, because uh, this understanding and discussing this slide in your class uh, will require considerable homework from your side each of these points that i've written can be uh, understood to be something like a hyperlink you know when when you read uh, any any web page you have several hyperlinks so if you click each of the hyperlink that it, it will open a new page so there is a large amount of content to be discussed for each and every of these points and uh, it, it takes time to uh, to uh, to go through so much of material and to be able to discuss uh, with with your students in class so simple things like uh, you know like uh, salination of soils or um, evaporative losses and how how they can um, uh, what are its consequences and things like that so um, i request teachers uh, very sincerely to go through this uh, it it will not happen overnight and uh, this um, i mean students will just maybe go through the slide and they they might not notice uh, what all there is but if you understand this then maybe you have understood many issues related to uh, to the uh, conventional ways of agriculture okay now another issue which again i'm not going to uh, spend much time on that but there are uh, a lot of resources on this this is uh, something very scary thing that is happening uh, which is the corporate monopolization of agriculture uh, the i i know the data presented over here is a, is a little old but i think um, it it is still easy to understand we see that in agriculture there are some relatively few Uh, very large corporations which are which are monopolizing the market so um, in this is 2001 uh, you have the 10 top 10 agrochemical uh, corporations they controlled 
84 percent of the market of the agrochemical market. If you look at veterinary pharmaceuticals, the top 10 companies control 60 percent of the market. And uh, um, 10, top 10 pharmaceutical companies control nearly 50 percent of the market. So, what we see is that fewer companies, fewer large companies are controlling the entire market. Now, that, that does not benefit the consumer because uh, once they control the market, then uh, we are basically at their mercy. If you uh, take GM crops, genetically modified crops, uh, the top six corporations controlled 90, uh, 98 percent of the world market in GM crops. So, only six corporations in the world basically control the entire market. And uh, those same six firms also control 70 percent uh, of the pesticide markets. So, in other words, what these companies are saying is that you purchase genetically modified seeds or uh, material from us and in order for those plants to survive, you have to also purchase pesticides which are available with us alone. So, you have to purchase the seed as well as the pesticide. So, basically they are, uh, they are making you addicted to them. And within that, uh, within uh, the GM crops, 94 percent of all GM crops were from only one company's germplasm and that was Monsanto. So, uh, that in my opinion is very risky. Now, uh, maybe you may say that oh, what is the problem in us depending on corporations for everything. Uh, yeah, there would not be any problem if the corporations were, uh, were uh, uh, very altruistic and committed to uh, the well-being of society. But um, the track record uh, shows that they are not committed to the well-being of society, they are um, committed to, the, uh, to increasing their profits and uh, poverty alleviation and feeding people or consumer health is, is hardly their concern. It, uh, they, they have uh, what they are interested in has been termed as bio-imperialism. So, it is a new form of imperialism where by, by controlling food resources, uh, by genetic modification and things like that, uh, that they want to basically uh, make the entire world their empire. Now, many people have, um, have objected to this and have, have seen uh, this pattern and have been uh, very disturbed by that. And I have a few quotations from uh, some people working in this. Uh, this for instance, uh, this biologist for instance says that what is profitable affects or even determines what is scientifically true. And where he is coming from is that if, uh, if these corporations are as powerful and as influential as they actually are, they can, uh, they can determine uh, the uh, funding for research also. So, the, these companies have uh, control the funding for research and naturally they are going to fund only projects which uh, support their findings or, or their interests. And um, so, there is, uh, you, you have much greater research uh, proving that genetic modification is good rather than vice versa and things like that. There are cases uh, of um, researchers uh, being, uh, being obstructed and uh, uh, they have had to go through a lot of misery because they, they went against these corporations. So, you can read that material, it, it is uh, on the open internet and you can form your own opinions. Uh, but uh, again, I would like uh, everybody to think whether you feel comfortable uh, handing over the entire uh, control of yours and your country's food resources in the hands of a few corporations, no matter how good they are. Because after all, corporations are run by human beings and uh, human beings may be one person is good, but what about the next person? One CEO of that company may be good, what about the next one? Uh, so, the, it uh, is not a good idea to do that. Uh, having food resources should be in the control of farmers and of consumers. So, the, and it should be distributed so that no one person can play too much mischief. Now, um, the modern agriculture is heavily dependent on the use of agrochemicals and uh, the pesticides particularly have got uh, very serious uh, health implications. Um, 
in um, all over the world it is estimated that something like 25 million agricultural workers in developing countries are poisoned by pesticides. In India, um, suicides by farmers uh, sometimes consuming poison are uh, consuming the pesticide itself um, are, are very common and uh, are a big national problem. Uh, th there is this video, it is a little long so I am not showing it. I have, I have some very interesting videos later for, um, for you. But this video talks about cotton and uh, starting from how it is grown, uh, how the farmer has to go into considerable amount of debt to acquire uh, the agrochemicals and he has to, uh, poor farmers do not have, um, uh, you know, they don't have bank accounts, they can't go to uh, walk to any bank and say, oh, give me a loan of uh, 5 lakh rupees. Uh, so, they have to borrow from money lenders or from the pesticide merchants themselves and the interest rates are extremely high for them. They are not uh, the, the standard uh, uh, bank interest rates, they are extremely high. Moreover, these people are quite uh, illiterate and uh, uh, even, even if the, whether the interest is high or low, I don't think they are capable of um, calculating it on their own uh, of how much they owe and things like that. Sometimes they have to hypothecate their land and uh, when they are unable to pay up, so they, they go into the so much of debt in the beginning of the season and then uh, depending on the weather, uh, the crop may either uh, be a great success or it may be totally destroyed and um, if it is destroyed then uh, there is no uh, revenue coming out of your farm and you go into debt and you have to borrow more and more uh, until finally uh, the farmer cannot pay up and uh, he decides to unfortunately end his life. So, this is how uh, uh, this, this problem actually gets so big. This video tells you about all those various aspects of how the, the farmer uh, goes to the market and even in the, in the market, he is not the person in control. The prices are decided by the traders and the traders um, probably look at the world market and uh, determine the prices. They look at their own interests and the world market and they fix the prices there and the farmer really has, um, has no um, security. So, if he cannot sell his, his product at, uh, at a decent price, when he has actually um, gone into debt in order to produce that, uh, then his, uh, his finances are in a very precarious position. The use of pesticide has been argued by uh, some people to be even in violation of uh, the constitution which uh, article 47 says that um, the, the state shall endeavor to uh, bring about uh, prohibition and consumption except for medicinal purposes um, uh, of things that are injurious to health and pesticides are injurious to health. Um, then there is, there is no, uh, no doubt that pesticides are poisonous. Uh, I mean just imagine if I invited you to, to dinner and uh, while the table is laid before you, uh, as you are just about to eat food, I say, um, oh just hold on one second and I spray some pesticide on it and say that, uh, no just making sure that there are, there are no diseases in it, so I am disinfecting it. Uh, would that work? Uh, it would not. As a child, I had this question. Um, I, I, I was told uh, as a child that uh, the, the gardening pesticides that were kept in one particular cupboard, that I was, uh, I was not supposed to go there. I was not supposed to touch it. I was not supposed to open that uh, cabinet because it is poison. Uh, and, and I understood that it is poison. Um, but then um, I was confused that the poison, if I directly touch it, it is poison. But if it, uh, if it is sprayed on garden vegetables and if I eat those vegetables, it is not poison. So I could not figure out uh, how come it ceases to be a poison when it is sprayed on uh, vegetables, fresh vegetables. Okay. And, and by the way, just simply washing uh, with water does not remove uh, some of those pesticides. So, conventional agriculture is associated with many more impacts um, uh, like the devastation of natural um, ecosystems. All those points that I listed in that table, uh, they apply. Uh, they, uh, conventional agriculture is, uh, is so popular because it benefits large corporations and the middlemen. 
but it impoverishes the poor farmer and makes the consumer unhealthy. So, uh, the, the farmer, the middleman and us, the consumer. So, on both ends, there, is, there are problems and the middleman gets fatter. So, that is that's the condition. Now, with climate change, yields are likely to reduce. So, this, uh, this map shows the, the regions uh, in uh, where the uh, yields are likely to reduce. Uh, in Pakistan is, uh, is uh, con the condition might be very serious, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Uh, in India also, uh, the, the yields are likely to, uh, to reduce. Assuming that uh, the world warms up by about 3 degrees, um, it would, um, this would be the situation. So, you know, for, for these countries which are uh, likely to be adversely affected due to global warming, uh, we, we really have to find a solution for that. Conventional agriculture does not help uh, uh, reducing deg uh, land degradation. In fact, it worsens land degradation. That is why I, I actually sh showed that slide. So, we have lots of impacts on the land and uh, South Asia, we have 50 percent of the land that is degraded. Uh, in China, you have 27 percent. Um, this shows uh, degraded, uh, a map of uh, soil degradation. So, the uh, reduction in yields is partly due to that. Now, uh, there are many causes of um, of soil degradation, land degradation, industrialization, uh, intensive agricultural practices, uh, overgrazing, overexploitation for fuel wood and deforestation. So, these are the various contributions are shown for different continents uh, and you can go through that later. This is a very nice video which uh, introduces uh, to you uh, and I, I think it is definitely worth showing to students. I am not going to show this video. Um, or maybe I should because you know that puts places in context uh, everything else. Um, so, this, uh, this video actually places in context uh, the, uh, the fact that um, soil is the basis of, uh, of the, our food production systems and that soil is a living entity, it must be protected and then there are various ways of soil degradation and agriculture, uh, the modern agricultural methods are uh, actually uh, causing uh, large amounts of damage. So, it will, it will help us uh, understand rest of the things. It also happens to be, uh, soil also happens to be the basis of um, successful organic agricultural methods. So, uh, successful organic agriculture actually begins from the soil. Uh, it does not, um, uh, I, I think in yesterday's session there was one, uh, one point of uh, do you allow a problem to first uh, manifest and then find a solution or do you try to avoid the problem coming up in the first place? So, if the soil is fed and if the soil is healthy, uh, then you avoid uh, uh, many of the problems like pest attack and things like that. So if your plants are healthy to begin with. Uh, so, that is also the basis of uh, organic agriculture and therefore, from both perspectives, uh, I think this showing this video is a good idea. So, this uh, video kind of in a, in a nutshell talks about soil erosion and uh, various methods of, uh, of protecting the soil. There, there, are, there are some more things that I, I will discuss in that. I was uh, just going through the, the chat box and uh, uh, there are a number of questions that have come. I will uh, I'll try to uh, answer at least some of them. Shastra University is excellent. Uh, the what is written over here is that we depend only on um, some 15 crops to satisfy roughly 90 percent of uh, the, the world's food requirements. So, they are basically they are rice, wheat, potato, maize and some others you know only 15 crops which, uh, which supply the bulk of our, uh, our food requirements. Now, that is, uh, that is in my opinion that is a very, very dangerous thing. Uh, if, we, if we depend only on fewer crops, if some disease attacks a certain crop or if um, you know global climate change promises to, uh, to pose very uh, new challenges, 
if some crops if these few crops fail we we can have deaths of people starvation deaths in millions whereas there are so many uh, other domesticated crops there are some 50000 varieties according to what he is saying i also have a similar number um, r- roughly 50000 um, uh, odd species that are already domesticated and then there are there are so many uh, other varieties which have not been domesticated but are, can can potentially be uh, be used so more research needs to go into that and uh, for for the already domesticated varieties uh, it it is a matter of we we choosing to uh, to depend on other varieties also uh, i i'll i'll talk a little about that uh, some in, in just a short while but thank you very much uh, shastra university for tanjavur shastra university tanjavur for sharing that it's really interesting okay uh, what what i think indirectly came up in the video was that the soil is a major carbon sink the soil can uh, hold large quantities of carbon in the biomass above the soil as well as under the soil the the, the root mass as well as the uh, decomposing humus uh, that is there so it is uh, the the largest um, Uh, terrestrial carbon reservoir in interaction with the atmosphere so um, if you plow the soil and you expose it to the hot sun what happens is uh, the temp- surface temperature of the soil increases drastically and uh, firstly the soil dries out and then at at high temperature and exposure to sunlight it oxidizes the the organic carbon that is present in the soil so the soil loses carbon even the soil loses carbon not only is it emitting co2 to the atmosphere which is worsening uh, the uh, greenhouse effect but it is it is also uh, losing the capacity to hold water so the fertility is also lost so then you have to add chemical fertilizers uh, so that's not the the best practice i i had mentioned and um, this is a slide which talks about a loss of uh, crop and wild biodiversity which I, I, we have very limited time so i cannot talk much about it somebody has also mentioned about that but i will i will show you i think more than me talking if i show you a small video of uh, dr vandana shiva uh, i'm i'm sure you can find a lot more reading material uh, through her she has uh, her own website and uh, she runs an organization navadanya as um, uh, professor parthasarthi had mentioned yesterday so this is only a short video there are many videos uh, uh, about vandana shiva and uh, about how she has been fighting the case f- uh, of india uh, against um, uh, other forces which want to patent our traditional crops and traditional variety they basically want to own our biodiversity so she has been very vocal and she has uh, uh, contributed immensely to um, uh, to uh, this area she has talked a lot about gmos and issues related to uh, genetic uh, engineering so uh, the things that i cannot cover in this uh, session i i would uh, point you to uh, to her and many there are many other people also who are working on on moodle i can share with you some more um, uh, resources this video is talking about uh, seeds uh, the importance of um, importance of seeds Uh, and how we we need to make sure that farmers are always in control of their seeds uh, no uh, foreign multinational company um, can control our seed so that's that's the important thing okay so um, i'm i'm almost done uh, for this session um what uh, dr vandana shiva and many others uh, in in our country are are t- saying is that genetic engineering is uh, not the way to go uh, it is not in the interest of our country in the long run and there are alternatives there are alternative ways and if you uh, if you go to navadanya.org uh, you will see uh, how she has actually used uh, women power to save the seeds and to uh, to grow food and uh, there are, i i saw some of the comments in the chat about the productivity of organic systems i am going to definitely deal with that issue right after the break um, the uh, let me say this 
I have visited several organic farms uh, which, uh, which are quite well known and all of them the, uh, the most important feature among them was high productivity. So, I think if you do it right, you will get good productivity. The same applies with conventional agriculture. It is not like you, you, you just simply dump some chemicals and some fertilizers and you are assured of good productivity. Even with conventional farming, there is, a, there is an element of skill, there is an element of getting it right. So, uh, that applies in organic farming also. In uh, organic farming, it is, it is uh, I do not think it is correct to say that organic uh, farming yields are, are low or, or have to be low. It is not so in my opinion. At least in my observation, it has not been so. So, uh, I will give you cases and uh, in, in one, uh, in a couple of videos, uh, they will actually mention what their yield is and then you can run that um, against um, uh, data from uh, which you can get uh, on the internet and check for yourself whether that yield is good or uh, bad. Okay. Um, industrial agriculture actually has a number of external uh, uh, costs which are not included in the in the price of the product it is uh, it it may appear that uh, the food that uh, that we obtain through uh, industrial agriculture is cheap but actually it is not so considering uh, so many people who who are poisoned considering the waterways uh, that uh, that get polluted uh, with fertilizers uh, fertilizer residues as well as pesticides and things like that, the land that gets degraded. If all those um, several external costs are uh, included in the price, then uh, in the long run, uh, industrial agriculture is, is not something that will uh, provide us uh, with um, food security. And th there, are, there are many things that I have, uh, I have listed over here. You can read through that uh, at, in your own time, but uh, definitely I, I would recommend a, a couple of videos. Uh, the, the one that I showed you 100 percent cotton that is a very nice video. This one is more comprehensive, uh, Nero's Guests. This is by um, uh, a very uh, eminent journalist P. Sainath. Uh, he has uh, covered this entire uh, aspect of uh, the plight of the farmers, how they get into debt, how they are forced to commit uh, suicide and how the, uh, the corporations uh, are, are basically trying to monopolize. It is a, it's a longish video, uh, maybe not, uh, not uh, convenient to show in your class, but you can um, definitely see it for yourself and uh, it will clarify many th aspects about uh, Indian agriculture as it is today and what are the uh, situations uh, of the farmers. Um, there is, uh, I, the farmers, you know, they end up getting into a debt trap, DEBT, -E and it also uh, becomes a death trap for them. Uh, this was a study in uh, in central India uh, on onion and potato farming, and I have I have summarized the results of how uh, how is it that farmers get into trouble. So uh, I have uh, just uh, summarized that over here. Uh, and the costs and everything are taken from those references uh, given below. And uh, it turns out, okay, this is what I have summarized from that study. So, that uh, for, for different studies it may be slightly different, but it says that the input is something like uh, 38,000 um, rupees per acre. Uh, if it is self financed and uh, they are using hired labor. Their, uh, their output would be this much, so their profit earned would be very little. So, if this is going to be the profit earned, uh, how can a family uh, of maybe four or five members survive on the farm? So, invariably they cannot afford hired labor because agric in agriculture labor costs are very high. So, they have to use their family labor. It means their children cannot go to school or their children end up missing school. So, it leads to very profound social uh, impacts when uh, such is the case. So, if, with, if their children do not go to school, then probably they can make uh, some amount of money. But if they, if they have borrowed funds uh, to start agriculture uh, and, and they are financed at very high lending rates, then um, they will end up in a, with a loss. Uh, if, they, um, if they use family labor, then the losses will be, uh, I mean, then it will be a little better. 
Now there are these engineered um, uh, price crashes, so the traders they kind of band together and they, they either increase or decrease the price in order to enhance their profits and farmers suffer terribly because of that. Uh, I had a, a friend in uh, somewhere close to Nasik, he had a farm over there and uh, he, uh, he had to literally because the prices crashed uh, in, in the year that he had a bumper crop, uh, he could not sell that and uh, the entire truck loads of his entire crop of uh, cauliflower uh, rotted and um, you know he, he basically quit farming after that. So, uh, so all these issues you know uh, kind of uh, work together and that is why farmers get into trouble. Um, at the end of the day uh, if you see it is the corporations which get um, more benefit than farmers which constitute 70 percent of India. So, uh, more than half of the benefits are going to corporations and less than half are going to, uh, to India and uh, farmers of India. So, industrial agri agriculture according to uh, not just me, but according to many people who are working in this field um, is, uh, is actually not going to be a solution, but it might actually increase food insecurity due to uh, all these uh, things that we uh, covered so far. So, um, let us meet after the break. Thank you.